Welcome everybody. I would like to welcome you to our conference on behalf of Medico International. My name is Anne Bloom. I'm the chairperson of the Medico International Association. Let me first of all tell you how happy we are about the great interest in this event. We had more than 6,000 registrations in the run-up, and even if just a fraction will be able to follow all the topics, it's still very gratifying to see what great response we've got. And I would like to thank everybody who put in so much work in the preparation of this document conference. Of course, everybody working for Medico, preparing the different topics, and it's our cooperation partners. We'll name them later on and we'll see them. And of course, I'd also like to thank all the technicians working for this event. Thank you very much indeed. But before we start, let me try to position this conference. We're an aid organization that has existed for more than 50 years and that provides active help in a great number of projects in diverse regions of the world. So we need to review and determine our emancipatory position again and again. And this means a high claim, and this will only work out if we challenge our help again and again. So it was at the latest in the 1980s when Medico started taking a closer look at the structures responsible for the misery of the world. Because even if it sounds paradoxical, help can even cement the conditions that it is to help against, even if it's urgently needed. So if we do not just want to be a cover and cushion things, we need to go into close quarters. That is, we need to, to combat against these conditions, because what we need to do is overcoming aid. We've had two conferences so far. We worked with many cooperation partners and started working on this dilemma and on this claim and trying to identify ways out in 2003, power and lack of power of aid, aid in times of globalization of war. This was about the depolitization and instrumentalization of aid. In 2014, beyond aid, we had this major question. What form of solidarity can bring sustainable change in a globalized world? And now, the third conference, the reconstruction of the world aid, solidarity, politics, what does it take to make the world a place which can be lived in freely and equally by all? All these questions raised are current and have a current uh, reference, and the first part of the conference will show this. Haiti is the group of items which will follow first. It shows how a political crisis can be turned into humanitarian crisis. In fact, we have these great uh, humanitarian issues, but aid must fail. We saw this after the earthquake in 2010. A second terrible example is the Moria refugee camp, which has burnt out in the meantime. The worst conditions were to be improved, but uh, the causes of taking refugee Refuge are not really identified and fought against. And of course, the COVID pandemic will also determine this conference because it brutally shows what disenfranchisement means. And the struggle for the vaccines shows quite clearly what a difference a radical democratic understanding of health may mean. Because it's quite obvious a pandemic like this can only be really uh, come to grips with together. The viruses don't stop at the borders. So vaccines and medicine should be seen as a common wheel. But uh, we will have to take a closer look at this. It is important for me to point out that we see in an exemplary way that without solidarity action 
and global thinking, we cannot overcome this crisis. And it's about this thinking that we want to discuss at this conference. The pandemic, of course, has practical influence on this conference as well. Originally, we had planned this conference, like the two conferences before, with people speaking on stage and an audience and with working groups. But the pandemic kept us from doing this. But the digital format we're now using, of course, also is a great opportunity, of course, only if everything is working, which we hope for. We're using this online format in order to communicate with our partners from different areas of the world and to talk to them. So we have an exciting change of perspective from the global south to the global north, and not just the other way around, as we're used to. In order to make sure that this will work out, we have simultaneous translation into Spanish, English and French. Fortunately, we also have some support, both in terms of content and in terms of funding. And I would like to thank all those who supported us. It's the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Fachbereich 3 of the Frankfurt University, the Institute for Social Research, the International Institute of Political Murder, and the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights. I would like to thank all of them for their support. Anne Jung, who is responsible for health and public relations, will now uh, give us some more information on how this conference will be run. But let me first of all mention something different, something we must never forget the fight for making the place a better place, making the world a better place, is dangerous in many parts of the world. Very often people are arrested and tortured and killed. And we have received the message of the death of our partner and friend, the Lebanese journalist and publisher, Lachman Slim. And this has deeply shaken us. He was murdered on February the 3rd. We would like now to commemorate him. Unfortunately, this illustrates in a very sad way how much the thinking of enlightenment, which we uh, are dedicated to at this conference too, how much this is feared. But let me now thank you for listening and let me hand over to Anne Jung. Thank you very much. Before we continue with our schedule, let's spend a minute in silence remembering Thoman Slim. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good day, good evening, wherever in the world you may be at the moment. My name is Anne Jung and I'm the head of Medico International's Public Relations Department. We have three days ahead of us during which we not only want to talk about the miserable state of the world, but also and above all about the possibilities of changing it, of its reconstruction. A reconstruction that points towards the world as a place in which a life in dignity and free from suffering, injustice and oppression is possible. 
it is not by chance that we have put reconstruction in brackets, for we explicitly do not understand this process as a recreation of life before the pandemic. For this world was already sick long before the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. Let us recall the days and weeks a year ago. Exactly. It took just the blink of an eye for the social and economic consequences of the virus to spread to the regions held in poverty around the world long before the virus itself even arrived. The focus of supply chains that are geared towards maximum exploitation was already causing impoverishment in many regions of the world even before the virus arrived. Millions of textile workers lost their jobs. As early as in March, our partners reported to us that they could no longer pay their tuition their children's tuition and that they had no money to see a doctor because during lockdown the buyers in Europe were no longer picking up the goods and they were no longer paying for the goods. They called for debt relief in order to call for solidarity and still their voices are unheard. People on the run had to interrupt their search for safe places, a standstill with often fatal results. And for those who had already arrived in reception camps in the target country or those who were still in transit, fact is that they are being considered a threat rather than the virus. As a result, medical assistance is being refused even if it could easily be provided. As in the camps on the Greek islands, about which we will hear more later, as our medical colleague Ramona Lenz said yesterday regarding the camp conditions on Lesbos, this must be called a crime. Countless people everywhere in the world had to spend their meager savings in order to ensure their survival for at least a few weeks. We can see that in capitalism, the virus is encountering conditions that are such that to comply with protective measures is becoming life-threatening for millions of people. Critical voices from Zimbabwe via Nicaragua all the way to Sri Lanka were silenced under the pretext of pandemic containment. When hundreds of doctors in Nicaragua last spring called upon their government to take stronger steps to contain the pandemic, Vice President Morijo called them extraterrestrials who live in other galaxies. She denied all danger and refused any assistance. And the global distortions, these global distortions, this needs to be said very clearly, are things that these days are sometimes driving us to despair. They're leaving us speechless. Yes, this pandemic is a global experience, but we cannot seriously close our eyes to its fundamental existential heterogeneity. In the rich countries with their still strong health systems and many office jobs, it is easier to safeguard against the virus, despite all drawbacks and the isolation, than it is in poorer countries where the infrastructure was severely weakened in the context of neoliberal cutbacks. The protection that we enjoy here is becoming a luxury that we are benefiting from. The virus isn't making us all the same. It is highlighting cracks in our global society. To not perceive this heterogeneity and these cracks would not only be lacking in solidarity, it would also close our eyes to possible change, to possible ways of reconstruction. And the COVID-19 pandemic is revealing the need for this reconstruction with an urgency rarely experienced. The project of global inequality is 
best exemplified by the unjust distribution of the vaccine so eagerly awaited by us all. This inequality of distribution is the consequence of political egotism and the vaccine capitalism of the industrialized nations. We are in the midst of experiencing the health crisis of the century, yet the industrialized nations are clinging to a system of patents and capitalization of health know-how. It was Germany, Europe, and along with them, nearly all industrialized nations that ensured uh, by means of non-transparent contracts that the knowledge concerning the vaccines was owned by pharmaceutical companies. The risks were to be borne by society, the profits privatized. BioNTech, for instance, was able to develop the vaccine with the help of more than 80 percent public funding. The profits, however, will be owned by the company to 100 percent. And it was the industrialized nations who, in their contracts, gave the companies the power to decide how, where, and in which quantity the vaccines were to be produced and how much they would cost. They have decided that the existing capitalist order was something they wanted to defend against the health needs of the people and against the epidemiological imperatives on pandemic containment at any cost by shooting down the initiatives of the Global South to discontinue patent legislation, for instance, at the World Trade Organization level. The result is an artificial shortage of vaccines. Be honest and say, my people first. This is what the former Rwandan health minister recently said. Don't lie to us and don't just say we are equal. This debate surrounding the vaccines illustrates, as in a paradigm, the state of the world, which we will be debating in the next three days. Help, solidarity, and politics. That's part of what we want to address at our conference. In the place of equitable access to the best possible health for all, and specifically access uh, to vaccines these uh, days, and in the place of access to rights, aid is being put in place. The COVAX initiative, which is connected to the World Health Organization and which is meant to ensure equitable and fair access to COVID-19 vaccines, is based on voluntary grants from states and the pharmaceutical industry and foundations. And apart from the fact that so far only a fraction of the funds needed was even collected, this type of of help is only becoming necessary in the first place because responsible poli political action is being denied us. Aid is legitimizing the denial of human rights. Those who act as the industrialized nations do is giving up on dealing with global problems and is using aid as an ill-fitting band-aid that, as Adorno put it in a nutshell, is intended to plaster over the visible sores of society, according to plan. These days, we are often accused by pharma and by politics that we are too radical when we talk about patents being lethal. But isn't there more ma radicalism in pharmaceutical companies and governments blocking measures that are in the very interests of humanity. A globally conceived health policy can only work if it is guided by human rights principles and if it thinks of patents on essential therapeutics, diagnostics, vaccines, and other medical goods as a global common access resource. Who owns the patent? 
the discoverer of the polio vaccine, Jonas Salk, was asked in the late 1950s. His answer was, the people do. Can you patent the sun? And he released the patent on the vaccine. So the time has come to imagine a new system and together to enforce it and build it up, a system that is based not on intellectual property, monopolies, and secrecy, but on approaches to medical research and development driven by public health, openness, collaboration, and equitable distribution. Reconstructing global health policy is a crucial contribution, but that alone clearly will not be enough. This and many additional aspects will be the topic of our conference. And that takes me towards the end. Discussing the world experience gathered in aid can help us uncover the beginnings of renewed politics and the practices of solidarity. These beginnings are already emerging in the global protests for climate justice, in transnational feminist and anti-racist movements, in local uprisings for democracy, human rights, and a dignified life. What these struggles have in common is that they have understood that for all these crises, there can only ever be global solutions. They call for the right to have rights. They call for a global justice, which is and will remain the first important prerequisite for global access to health. In our experience with aid, we're seeing this very clearly also in Haiti and in Lesbos, two islands that exemplify the exclusion of the right to have rights. And that is why it is these experience we want to begin with tonight. In the following three days, we want to build on the experiences from Moria and Haiti. We want to think the reconstruction of the world. We want to ask questions that we have come up with in the course of many conversations that we had in-house with our colleagues, with our partners everywhere in the world, with our speakers, and with the co-organizers that we have mentioned. The starting point of this endeavor is immutable. The relationship between aid, solidarity, and politics is determined by the promise we all have given ourselves in the Declaration of Human Rights. The promise of a social and global order in which all the world's inhabitants are accorded rights which are fully realized. Now, I hope we will have good discussions in the following days, and I'd like to thank you.